and then we should be recording and welcome everyone uh, week one officially because I use a week zero system where week zero is getting things set up. So we're in the first week of the open flip course and our topic for this week is the first pillar, which is anybody? Are anybody? you asking me or yeah, what's the first others? flip learning? Nobody's going to blur it out. I'm, I'm going to let them off the hook, Ken. We're going to talk flexible environment. All right. That's good. So that's, that's our topic. We sent out, um, so uh, just for kind of administration of the course, we sent out on the Sunday evening the link to the course uh, set up for this week and the topic of flexible environment. We set up a, a few links. One is to a uh, pretty aged post from Brian Bennett from about eight years ago. Um, actually, my link was broken, so I had to do some sleuthing and, and uh, spelunking through Brian's website trying to find the new link for that same post. I did find it, so that was good. And um, that and the SCD article and a um, YouTube uh, video, which is pretty short, but it was something that, that uh, one of the first members of this course back in 2014 linked to me, uh, Erika Cabanilla, if I remember correctly. And um, so that was the idea is you're, you're going to watch or read that. But then, as always in all of my courses, if you didn't like what I assigned for reading and you find something else that works for you in the area of flexible environment and flip learning, well, then go ahead and read that and share that and, and write about that. And ideally, um, contact back to the group. Oh, um, I just ordered, answered a survey today that a colleague's doing on open education. Um, and I talked to my students about this yesterday that the idea is it's a community of learning. So um, we really want to make um, interaction more likely. Uh, in the email I sent out, I sent a link to a post inside the Flip Learning Network group on Facebook. So anyone who had ideas about this week's uh, topic could just, you know, jump in the thread there underneath where I posted the original one, or they could post their own if they really wanted to. Uh, and have a discussion. And the Spanish uh, language group, I posted a, a link there as well in the same group, trying to pull everyone together. I, I noticed that people noticed the link because we got a whole big uptick on people applying to uh, be part of the group. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned to both Matthew and, and Katie, who are part of the board of directors, um, and Matt's our new director or um, chair, is uh, one thing that's cool about that group is I'm not the only admin. So sometimes I get notified that someone applied to uh, go to the group and someone's already uh, let them in through the door. And it's probably Matthew or it could be Katie or it could yes. be any yeah. of us with yeah. admin privileges. It's kind of nice actually, it's distributed administration. So that's the idea is I really want people to not just um, read the information, find other information, share about the information, but try to interact, whether it's through the Facebook group or through Twitter, share out your post and, and include that hashtag open flip tag, throw in flip class if you want to or anything else uh, and, and then engage people. And, and Daniela came today and, and I noticed her post um, just recently. And so I shared it out and I tagged Brian Bennett because I thought, hey, what the heck, maybe Brian will jump in and actually answer. So. Uh, that's part of how Twitter works is you, you try to engage people and sometimes they don't answer. Sometimes they're busy or they dropped off Twitter for months like some of our friends have. Uh, but sometimes you get a good engagement coming back. So I wanna try to foster that. Um, that's part of what this course is besides just the flip class. So let me um, stop talking so much and let's, let's hear what other people think that this flexible environment is about? What does it mean to you in your classes or what do you think it will mean to you in your classes? As I drink coffee, do have, you have anything to share, Daniela or Durley? I'll start with the DS. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yeah, oh, sorry, if there was some, uh, someone I interrupted. No, go ahead, Daniela, we'll go okay. after Okay, all right, Daniela okay. Before Durley. Um, all right. Um, well, my thoughts on flexible, uh, the flexible learning environment um, were kind of, I, I said in my post that um, 
I find it kind of romantic, <laughs> like a romantic <laughs> yes. idea. Yeah. yeah, I think that, I mean, ideally, that, that's really good, but um, the thing is that when we belong to an institution, then there are a lot of things that we cannot, I mean, be so flexible. So it would be great to be able to be very, very flexible, but there is a moment when you have to grade students when um, yeah. students have to hand in, when students, um, when you can't accept any more things or you cannot be right. any more flexible, not because you don't want to, uh, but because you have to, uh, you mm -hmm. have to um, call it a year, let's say, and, and complete right. forms. And, and so that makes it really difficult. Another thing that I found uh, as I wrote too, is the fact that I try to uh, create open uh, spaces where students can interact and basically where students can show what they do um, and can say and compare what they do and what their what their partners are doing. Um, I teach I said this um, in, in the previous meeting, but I teach phonetics um, and I, I teach segmental and super segmental uh, phonetics for Spanish speakers. So it's very important uh, to listen to others and to compare your own production to your partner's production. I mean, in many cases, we are kind of deaf to what we produce and we think that we are saying something or we are not actually saying that. So I try to, I use uh, SoundCloud a lot and I ask students to post, um, to post the, the links to their SoundCloud accounts in a Padlet and to, to have different options for them. And, and I, I insist on their listening to their classmates and make comments saying, well, you can improve this very well quality or that was not the, the tone you were meant to produce. And they don't. <laughs> they actually don't do that. They find it very hard to be critical of right. their partners in a good way. I mean, not to be aggressive, but hey, I think that this is not what we mean in Spanish, for instance, where uh, we find it very hard to produce plosives um, and because we've got fricatives in that sound, so we don't have g, we say r, right? Yeah. So um, students say shuhar, shuhar, yeah. right? Or they don't think so. Instead of saying, well, no, it's not, uh, I know, uh, you, you have to cut, to cut, say, to cut the, the, um, the, the good. They say, no, no, it's not good, it's word, word, right. instead of g. And, well, they don't do that. Um, right. They just compliment to you, their partners. Oh, well done. Well, no, it's not well done. You nice. should say that it's not. <laughs> I mean, you have to help your partner, not to. Reminds me of a. <laughs> reminds me of an Alec Koros post on, uh, I think it was on Facebook the other day about how, why I don't use discussion forums and, and uh, assign discussion forum interactions because every interaction is a post and then wow, I really like what you wrote there. Oh, good job. And there's like actually no depth to it. And, and mm -hmm. so I guess the question is, how do we get students to do that differently? How do we get them to give critical mm -hmm. feedback? Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Others? Katie, maybe? You look like you're going to jump in there. I, I, I don't like criticizing people. So um, <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I'm, I feel mean, and so I don't want to do that. And I know you're really helping somebody when you do it. Um, and I get that, but man, it's just hard to come out and say, wow, that's just terrible. Um, I've gotten much better at it in the last couple of years, but that's because of the job that I do right now. So, um, mm -hmm. but the, a teacher gave me a nice phrase that I, I'm, I'm sharing with my, I'm trying it this semester with, with uh, my students when they're doing the discussion, because I, the, the class is built, it's been approved, this is what it is kind of thing for the online class. And, and the phrase is, whatever, fill in the blank. Blank was good. It would be better if blank. So, so you're giving them this phrase that says, I acknowledge you worked hard, I wanna help you get better. Right. And so, it, it does two things. It gives them an opportunity to find that th there's got to be one thing in here that's good. I know it's awful, it's but they're going to find the one good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then, you know, you can even say, wow, that was an amazing post. I liked everything about it, but I wish you would have talked about blah, blah. And then mm -hmm. if that's the expectation for all of them, what I'm hoping is 
I'll see more of it because I don't know that anybody, just like students need to learn to study. They've never learned to do this. Or if they learn to critique. No. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like Troy Cochran, I remember talking a lot when I, when I met Troy about um, watching the videos or just reading. Like we just assume students know how to do critical academic reading and they don't. Mm -hmm. they, they know how to just, you know, read a comic book or, or like just read for pleasure, but they don't know how to underline, take notes, all of these academic ways of reading or giving feedback. I think a lot of times we just assume they've seen that before they got mm -hmm. to us. <laughs> and it's probably not true. Your thoughts, Matthew? And you, you made a great point about the institutionalization. If you're within mm -hmm. a certain institution, there's a certain amount of just momentum that can't be built because you have a fixed structure and the weight of that structure is is part of the process and it's it's kind of interesting i'm i switched schools after 20 years at a school now i'm in the k-12 situation but moving to a different school there's a whole different set of understood structures that everybody either understands because they've been there or they are enunciated structures that those we don't change that structure that structure is untouchable that kind of thing and even as a person they've brought in to fix some of that challenge um they're also saying oh but don't touch that one and so you're right that flexible environment can be a challenge when you are in a system in which interconnecting parts are not allowing change so when we talk about a flexible environment we sometimes have to, that's a relative term, uh, as far as what are we flexing? We may not be able to flex the structure. It may be, as you mentioned, flexing the way we have the students interact with each other within the larger structure. We may not get a choice on some of the big items, but we can, we can squidge outside the line on certain aspects. So I, th I think sometimes we, we like to think that unless we're changing it all, we're not changing. Well, That's to be point. fair, most change happens very slowly. And there's things we can change. I mean, sometimes, yep. and I've talked to faculty where it's, they have a bunch of deadlines and the deadlines are, are really structured for two ways. The deadlines is kind of pacing our students and, and that's a good thing. But then I've, I've had you know, colleagues and probably us and me that we submitted, you know, deadlines, and then we collected a whole bunch of homework assignments, but we didn't get around to marking them till like the day before we have to submit grades. So they're not, that, that deadline was so artificial because they handed it in on like the 2nd of August, but we didn't like mark it and give it back to them till the 22nd. So then why couldn't they have handed it in on the 18th or 19th, two weeks late, if we weren't gonna even look at it till then? So there, there is some flex in the system, but obviously, um, as I found out when I decided my deadlines were all the last day of classes of each semester, um, because that's my hard deadline, like the legal, I'm not allowed to accept homework after the last day of classes, technically, according to academic regulations, some teachers do, um, but I don't. Uh, and then students complain, they said, Ken, you can't make them all do at the end of the semester because then I'm not getting a guideline of where I'm supposed to do when. So now mine, I'll accept anything late, I don't care. But mm -hmm. my deadlines are still published and there are still a guideline, they're a suggestion. I don't like the canvas gives them a red marker that says it's late when they hand it in late. I'm, I'd like to change it to Fuchsia. And um, Laura, who joined us last week, she has some cool JavaScript hacks for Canvas. Uh, so I think that you can change the colors of those things so they're not you know red, you they're a nice Fuchsia or um, other tone. Um, if, if but I think my students really like that, but they don't get it because I had a student today who might have COVID and he, he sent an email to some teacher saying, please, are you able to be flexible? And I answered saying, well, I'm always flexible. This is part of my plan with all of my students. I hope you know this, um, but don't worry um, if you need some help, I'll help you out. But they still don't get that. I'm yeah, that's flexible. true. But do you know what's the other thing? I was thinking about my context. Uh -huh. Students are used to be so yeah. worried about the grades. Yeah. So if we don't change that mindset, it's going to be like really hard to be kind of flexible. 
because what yeah, I have process. realized is like, okay, I, I can design many activities. I can see if they are practicing what I'm teaching, but then they, they ask, but teacher, are you going to grade us this thing? And I'm like, are you learning or not? Yes, teacher. <laughs> okay, then we are going to talk about the grade. But right. yeah, it's, it's more the thing about the cultural, the education culture that we have yeah. towards grades and rules and how class should be than the thing that the real thing, like the learning, are they learning for real or they are just doing things for getting an, a, a high grade? So I think it's quite difficult. Kate Baker has a really good phrase there of, of good enough. I think, I think that's what she said when, when she was, when we were down in Bogota, Durley, where you're submitting when it's just, it's good enough to submit and, and it's good enough to get the grade as opposed to taking the extra time to really polish something off. And that, that's an effect of our grading system, but it's also effect of deadlines. One of my students said before, I've got all these other things to do tonight. I'd really rather wait till Monday and give you a much better delivery than get it good enough tonight and get it to you before midnight tonight. So those, those but terms I know are that really you're flexible. You can build that into your class. And they, right. I think that, you know, once they trust you, that you're really not like yep. laying in wait for them, you know, and, and, and they're comfortable asking that. Yeah. And, you know, do I dare email my professor and say, well, she things are not going the way they should. I need help. Yeah. And, and if the response is absolutely what do you need, then, it, and, and you just throw in there, it's really about the learning. It's not about the deadline. Mm -hmm. Tell them when the absolute end of the course is or whatever, you know, just, and if you can set or that up with them. Early, you know, this was due a couple difference. days ago. How are you doing? How can I help you? And I think that the, the, the extreme too is if I'm saying I'm flexible and like none of my students handed it in on that deadline, am I still going to, am I going to avoid that? Well, now I'm going to get upset and, and react and overreact and get strict because like everyone's playing the, well, Ken's Mr. Flexible. Um, we got to be careful of that too. I don't you know that though. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's weird. I'm holding a green pen, so you can see. <laughs> With your green screen. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, ADHD. Um, here, I'll hold something that's not Squirrel. real. Um, but I have, to, I have to have something. But, you know, Dearly's point is, you know, they, they focus on the grade. They focus on the mark. Uh, that's something that I'm really struggling with in yeah. my online college class that I teach for students that are struggling learners. This is a junior college. This is a community college. This is a, mm -hmm. this is developmental before they even get to credit work. And I, I organize this class with exactly two due dates uh, because we talk about structure. I have to have grades at the halfway point and I have to have grades at the final point. So that's when I set the two due dates, but I organize my, my learning week one, week two, week two, week three, and I tell the people, I said, folks, the week one, week two is just the pace. It's the pace of the race. Um, and the grades don't happen until October and the grades don't happen until December. But for some folks, this is a real challenge for them to say, so, so week two isn't due at the end of week two. No, that's a pace. This yeah, is, this is a long race. I wish... I wish I had a way to put like a horse on a line or something and just move the little felt horse kind of elementary style, primary right. school style to say, we're this far. You ought to be somewhere in this ballpark right. and then That's move strange. this far and, and, and move towards, I keep trying with both high school and college to keep telling them, folks, this is a process. This is a process, mm -hmm. and so you ought to be about here in the process. Mm -hmm. And so working within the constraints, but I still find that I have to pace those learners because they're mm -hmm. not mature to the place that, that they can pace themselves. But then I have others like Dearly has mentioned that they are so worried about that number I say, well, this is just your progress to this point. This mm -hmm. grade does not represent your mark. 
It represents your progress. And that that's something socially they're just having trouble understanding. Well, yeah, I, I really I agree with what you say about the process. We do we do that. We actually do not fail any students till the the end of the course. And courses that take the complete um, the complete year. So uh, the thing is that again teaching phonetics and things. So there are a lot of things to uh, to learn and and to. Um, and to acquire, and that takes time. So in general, there could be students who fail all the tests, all of them, or do not hand in, but then the important thing is that by the end of the year, they've got an intelligible, for instance, uh, pronunciation and manage the, um, the topics they have, to, they have to learn. The thing is that what we do is to tell them exactly what you said. This is the way you should go and the importance of doing this um, in parts is that we can help you get better. If we haven't got any recording for three months and you hand in all your recordings all together in July, there's no way we, you, you, we can see that you have improved during the first four months. I mean, say first because we started in March. So we need to see the process. Now it's your choice if you don't want to hand in anything you might, in any case, still be um, up to standard by the end of the year and still pass the course. But if we have to give you some advice, we'll do it um, in steps so that we can give you feedback and we can see the process. Otherwise, we cannot do that. But we'll still, there could be, uh, there could be students who hand in transcriptions or work, a lot of work all together at the end. Um, yeah, it's all right. They have done things, but there's no way to test the process. Right. I want to let Viv jump in. If she has a thought, but, it, but what I'm thinking is setting up a mirror to us that are taking this course or involved in this course and how we are approaching it. Um, because Ken puts a deadline uh, of Sunday and actually it worked really well the first week. A lot of people handed things in early. And the point of, that's great about handing it in early is, and, and it's an open course, this is the main thing, is that everyone else can go, I have no idea what to do. Oh, look, Daniela posted. I can see what she did, and then it gives me another idea, or they've <laughs> already posted. And, and it's really, really powerful, but I am I know that a lot of people don't understand how that works, because I, mm -hmm. I just answered a survey about open education. I'm going to share it later to the, to the group. Um, and, and reflecting about, we expect our students to do this, but then are we doing this when we're involved in a PD? Or do we just wait till, oh, it's due Sunday at midnight and it's like 10 p.m. on Sunday and we're cranking out that thing we have to hand in so we get the points for the PD that we need for our training courses. Mm -hmm. Viv? No, I, I think I, what I was, uh, I was going to say goes in line of what I'm listening mm -hmm. because um, well, I, I'm still working in my essay for this week. Yeah. But for me, I know this is, as uh, Matthew mentioned, that this week's topic is about flexibility, right? But for me, it is about the um, appropriate combination between orthodoxy and flexibility. Because mm -hmm. I think um, not, all, not all the things are under negotiation. Right. So I think Mm, when you recently say um, there are many students that don't really know how to mm, critique or mm -hmm. do whatever so we still need um, uh, explicit instruction right but I think sometimes explicit instruction is demonized or something because it's a uh, I yep. don't know. It, it's we nope. we need to keep balance, and I and I really loved this um, reading uh, that's named "If They'd Only Do Their Work," because yep. I think it, it it's it, it tells us about this uh, balance or the balance because yes, you can negotiate new. Uh, deadlines or um, if you are not interested in what I propose you uh, okay so 
we can renegotiate your learning objective. Right. But at the same time, there are certain rules to follow and we need to get to some place. If we're gonna discuss chapter three from this novel, then it's really kind of important that everybody's read that chapter three from the novel. Maybe there's some extra stuff around it, but you can't really contribute very well if you haven't got the same background as a lot of other people. So yeah, there's definitely limits. Matthew? Well, and, and I think Vivian makes a good point. Flexibility doesn't mean lack of organization. Okay. You know, yeah. um, or, uh, or downgrading your standards Right. Quality standards. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. And that's, I think that's an important thing that, especially as whether it's flipped or whether it's any sort of methodology, gets out beyond those that have uh, experimented with it, those that have tested it, those that have developed mm -hmm. it, as it gets into mainstream, uh, regardless of whatever it is, uh, folks begin to look at it and say, oh, well, then it's this element that's important and and they neglect those other elements. So for example, oh, we need to be very flexible. Yes, but to be flexible, the thing that makes the flexibility available is the fact that you are organized. One thing that, that flipping did for me, because I, I, I have this theory, I don't know how well it holds up, but as a general rule, you have two general types of teachers. You have the preparation teacher and the personality teacher. Uh, one gets by on organization, preparation, and being careful. The other one gets by on putting on a great show. And, and, and by being, you know, the goofy one or the fun one or the whatever one, whatever their personality is. And for me, I was very much a personality teacher and organization was haphazard. One thing that flipping did for me is it made me decide before I went to put on the show what was important in the show, what did I need to prepare for the show, what was, uh, you know, uh, I, I make a joke on a regular basis that I much prefer the Muppet mentality of let's just go put on a show, guys. Uh, but my, it's so much better. My teaching is better. Everything that I do is better if I'm willing to, yeah, keep the personality, but put the preparation and the organization in up front. That's the part that Flip has given me, is it forced the personality to prepare and be organized. So now when I bring them together, I can be flexible because I'm organized. And there's I can, the third pillar too, Matt, the intentional, that you're being yeah. really intentional about which content you're choosing. But, but for me, it was always, as long as I have myself and a marker, we're good to go, guys. Oh, I'm a much, a story. <laughs> that's it. I, I'm a much better teacher now that I am prepared more. And I mean, this took me till 12 years into my career mm -hmm. to really come to that place to figure out that that was a much more important thing. And so now the kids can see my organization and the kids can rely on that organization. So when I'm being flexible, I'm pushing them back to that organization. Yes, but you still have to do this, this, and this. Right. Yes, I'm flexing this, but this, this, and this are still true and still unavoidable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's really good point is flexibility does not negate organization. In fact, be, to be flexible, you need to be even more organized. Yeah, I, I believe in any case that what I believe that what Viviana was uh, pointing out is that it could be discouraging for students who, um, who do everything for every lesson, right? Yeah, and to in the end mm -hmm. get the same to the same place uh, to one that was lagging behind and not doing things. So exactly. that's it's what like I believe. It's, it's like that ultimately it doesn't have a value <laughs> the, the 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 assignments and mm -hmm. the activities in my experience um mm -hmm. i could say that what it, it does happen right i mean the student that that is responsible organized and likes um meeting deadlines will still do it even if there is another one that doesn't do it 
But what, what is important is that if you show that by doing what you ask, um, it's easier, better, and you get better results, eventually the one who doesn't do it is going to say that he needs to do it. Uh, right. That's my experience because what usually happens is that those students who fall behind and maybe fall behind for three or four months, in the right. end cannot catch up and eventually no. uh, fail the course. So that's a way to teach them too that they need that we can be flexible, but that doesn't mean that they're going to learn in the same way. That we can allow yeah. them to <laughs> fall behind, Time but that's that, critical. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it takes a long time to learn that. Um, my students asked uh, mm -hmm. a famous software engineer who was visiting our class on Friday, what's the three thing, or what's, what are the things that are important to learn that we didn't, mm -hmm. we're not gonna learn in university? And he was about to say, well, do you learn anything important in university? But he's not quite that sarcastic. But he, <laughs> he pointed out three things, and one of them was time management. Like we do not teach students how to do time management. And as soon as you throw flexibility in the, in the, in the mix, they're not used to it. They're not used to having flexibility. I've had this in this type of course that I've taught where I gave teachers like, here, choose three of these eight readings. And they're like, ah, I can't do that. I can't read all eight. I'm like, no, I, I said you could choose which ones. And they're like, but I'm not used to having choice. And a lot of students are not used to having choice and they don't need, they don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So flexibility yeah. is not something we're used to maybe. That's, that's yeah, I would like to problem. like to share something. Uh, I'm trying to to be flexible in the sense that I'm not be there all the time. Like, okay, today we're going to work in groups. So you're going to do your meet link for each group. I'm going to say hi, and then they ask me. But at the end of the class, I ask you, okay, what did you learn today? Like, how did you feel today? Because I'm trying to include for a research purpose. Uh, I'm trying to include like uh, emotional part. So the first thing that we do is like, okay, we are going to make some exercises because we are going to have lots of work today. And we, the idea is that we are going to get to this point by the end of the class. So I think that uh, using our language, like the way we talk to them also influencing that flexibility. Yeah, it's not like, okay, it's up to you. I'm gonna give you a bunch of activities and that's it. It's not like, okay, I'm going to be through your learning process. And you're going to tell me when did you need me and how can I help you? But I'm also worried about how did you feel doing these kind of activities? Then they become like a bit more responsible about their learning. And that, I mean, and that has worked for me until now this semester. And I can see on the quizzes, for example, I'm using a model and in the model I make like a short quiz, a small quiz, and the results are nice and they feel like, okay, I'm doing this by myself. So I can do it better if the teacher is not really there all the time. That was the problem that we have last semester when we changed into this crazy thing. So I think that including that kind of emotional stuff, like uh, monitoring sometimes, not always, allow them also to change that uh, mindset and be more autonomous and more responsible about the things that they are learning. as I'm nodding away. Um, so now you mentioned COVID. So um, a lot of people keep asking me for questions of how to adjust their classrooms, and especially maybe with faculty that have been around longer. I'm not gonna use the word older or be ageist, but are, are set in their ways of they're used to teaching in a classroom and lecturing and, and such, and um, how can they adjust to this and how can they adjust it? Well, many of their students don't have good internet, they can't connect. Um, and my advice is almost always, we need to really move more asynchronous and less synchronous classes. And so asynchronous goes hand in hand with flexibility. Um, so how are we all thinking about that? I've been thinking a lot about that, but I, I was wondering what you all are thinking about how to move to more asynchronous specifically. So I, this summer I taught two, well, in the middle of spring, my college course was like spring break, we're not coming back, you're going online. And so you had to shift the entire course that was built for face-to-face -face learning online. And which I probably did better than many just because I'm used, I already had a lot of it already built. 
I'm, yeah. I'm used to that. Um, and so even though we did a lot in class, but I, I lost the piece that I loved the most, which was the, the group work and the discussions and I think it's one of those pieces that I rely on the most mm -hmm. to, to gauge my students. Right. I, I lost that piece of, at, when I walk out of that classroom, I can tell you at the end of a class who understood it and who didn't. And before they take a test, I can already tell you what their grade's gonna be. I, I already know. You don't even have to take the stupid test. I can tell you <laughs> what you're gonna get. And, and that's gone. And I'm not, I, and I taught, taught online and I'm, to summer, which the summer classes, summer physics with a lab, beat down, don't judge anything by that at all. It's fun face to face, but it's still a beat down. But I'm doing the, the online again and it's spread out. So hopefully that'll be a better experience, but I don't, I changed my, so it's kind of getting away and getting, making it more personal. Like, like Dearly said, that, that emotional piece, instead yeah. of the standard, you know, introduce yourself, tell us about why you're in college. Like, it was like, we're playing two truths and a lie. Go. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so tell me I'm about yourself, do all that, but I want two truths and a lie. And then instead of responding, oh, I'm, I'm going to go to that college too, or oh, I'm studying that, figure out what they're lying about. And, and so I'm going to try to interject that kind of thing in and maybe well, hopefully maybe. It'll t turn more towards the physics piece. But if it doesn't, it'll still help build that community. And, but if they don't, if they don't talk to me, I don't know. I offer a weekly, you know, I'll be here at seven o'clock and I'll answer any of your questions and some show up and some don't. I had one for the second Zoom, because again, for my online class, uh, we did it over the summer, math in eight weeks for 18 week course. Ooh, that's brutal. Yeah. Okay, but at 18 weeks, I'm afraid the sense of urgency isn't going to be present to carry us through that. Right. Um, and and I'm it's going to be interesting to see what how that holds up. And I have online I have a dis ongoing weekly discussion that is basically. Who can help what? Who needs help? How can we help each other? That was the idea. That's one thing. Then I have the, and that works pretty well. The live in, in the live Zoom hasn't been working. Uh, for my high school kids that I, that I see full remote, we are full remote. We do not see them in person except via Zoom. Uh, I'm using a whole bunch of Flipgrid, which is I send out a video um, uh, prompt. They send video prompt back. I can respond vice versa. The only problem is everybody else in the world has found that one and it was down for three days. Um, and I'm sure that that novelty is going to wear off as well. But I just assigned my first five day project where they were to simply view some things about the history of mathematics. And I had to think very carefully about my questioning because I didn't want to ask factual questions. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask opinion questions, mm -hmm. uh, emotional reaction questions, perspective questions as a math assignment. So that's a stretch for me. So as we talk about being flexible environment, the first start of flexible environment happens between my two ears. Mm -hmm. And, and so I have to rethink, how am I going to assess and encourage interaction, I can't count mm -hmm. on the structure of school to provide it for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vivian, do you have a thought? Of how to assess interaction? Yeah, well, that, that's pretty. Uh, if I had that answer, what would you give me? <laughs> exactly, lots and you lots of rich. cash. That's right. Have it all solved. Well, something that I had found uh, and that I, for me was very surprising was well, first of all, that we started directly online this year. When we started in March, we started already in lockdown, so that was 
that was very challenging. First of all, because we had to move everything online, but then because I've got first year students at university and second year students. And first year students, well, in general, it happened with, all, with everybody, with first year students at university, I mean, freshers were kind of a shock to start university and suddenly to be online. Uh, but what we found was that we thought that our students knew far more than what, we, what they actually know. So uh, we had to teach them to learn online. So they believe that they manage technology far better than we do. But they don't. They manage technology no. to use Twitter, to use Facebook, to take pictures, or, but they it's don't know how to learn with technology. So it was, it was a great effort to teach them how to use the different technologies they had at hand first, and then to move on um to to teach what we have to teach and it was i live in a university what was a kind of university city so a lot of students come from different parts of the country um and the good thing was that um they most most students could go back to their houses and that helped a lot because they were comfortable with their families the first month when they couldn't move and they were locked in our city and away from their houses uh, was very hard um, in, in their emotions and things. And, and then when they could go back home, uh, that improved a lot when they found themselves with their families. And then another thing that we found was that a lot of students um, were uh, very happy to have everything recorded. And they said that it was far better this year than previous years because they, they could not access the theoretical lessons because they are optional, but they, many of them could not attend these lessons because they work or for many other reasons. And so now they have them online and because they are recorded. And so they say, well, that's great because we, I, I, I can never join the lessons live, but I can watch them and I can take notes and I record them and I stop them and I go back and this and that. So in the end, uh, this ended up being very inclusive. Very hard, but very inclusive. So I think that even when we return to our normal teaching, it's not going to be, um, even with a vaccine and everything, I believe that we're not going to be um, the same. <laughs> we're not going to give the same lessons at all. Yeah. And people do take no. advantage of that. Because let's see, there was four of us here. You were here, Daniela and, and Durley and, and two others plus our guests last week. And there's 41 views on that post. I don't think they watched the entire hour, but there was 41 views. And then for the Spanish one, which had a lot of people live, um, but there was still about 50 views of the, the one from Spanish from last week. So it's, you know, putting off phase so people can watch it later is useful. Well, I don't know how useful it is to watch us talk, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it is interesting. Uh, Danielle made a good point that the they didn't know as much as we assumed they knew for technology. Mm -hmm. I think that's one advantage for those of us that are veteran flippers. We already knew that. Yes. <laughs> because, you know, some of these folks, some of these folks like, well, I'm just going to go right into this. And I, 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 I did training after training in the last couple of weeks. And at every single one, I put up a schedule that was basically a traditional classroom schedule. And I said, if you do this, I am warning you, it is your own demise because you will not be as productive. It is impossible. And if you think the students are going to keep up on the technology, this one. they're not. And so it blew, it blew some of my coworkers' minds when I said, no, week one for me is nothing but introducing the tools I'm going to use the rest of the semester. Because if I take the time, just like yep. a craftsman on a job site, if I take the time Safety to go, clean the site, prep the site, prep the tools, I'm going to be far more productive throughout the remainder of the time. And I think it, it, I'm, I'm making some converts. Uh, and the kids, I, have, I haven't had any emails 
that saying, I don't know what this, I don't know, this is, I'm all lost. That's and kind of like the, the answer is because we're taking the time to build that foundation. Tools. Right. And, and, and I think it's really important, those of you that haven't started teaching yet this semester or term or period or whatever your, uh, your phrases are for that is take that time, whether it's a week or not, to really build some trust and build some community and, and teach your students yes. how to network because they're not used to doing this. I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm, I'm, I just hang out with people online all the time. I knew Katie very well before we met in person because we're on Twitter and, and Durley as well. And Viv, we have never met in person yet, but we, yeah. we've spoken a lot over this summer online. But modeling that and, and helping our students understand that, it's not easy. It's, and I linked a digital, uh, uh, sorry, uh, visitors versus residents, which I like much better to look at that work as opposed to the work of uh, digital natives. I won't name the name, but I had a fight with them once about, about the term um, because I, I don't think I like the term digital natives. We need to teach our students to use technology in a productive, in a resident format where they're producing content with technology and not just being consumers. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I linked that in the chat and I'll link it out later as well. Mm -hmm. So um, learning about technology and uh, building community and what else? Um, Communicating okay policy. Being okay that you don't know something is yeah. so important. Yeah. Another thing that I found very interesting was the kind of netiquette that we had to yeah. put up to. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They thought we they were interacting with their yesterday. friends. <laughs> yeah. we, had a, we had a discussion I, yesterday about constructing your code of ethics or constructing your, we were really struggling with words. We didn't want to use code because it's kind of like in concrete. Uh, constructively as a class building up the rules for your classroom and participatory doing this. I had a session with Mahabali and, and Rissa Sorensen and Autumn and, and Mia Zamora and others. I think I tweeted about it yesterday. But it was wonderful talking about how to come up with those rules of conduct mm -hmm. um, together as a class and, and saying what's right and what's not as opposed to just laying down the laws is a great way to start your semester for all of you. Well, and I never thought I would have to, I never thought in my classroom I would have to share with the students that you can't be under your bed covers while attending class. Yes. <laughs> Online or for shirtless. Zoom. Or shirtless. Um, you cannot please sit up for Zoom live class. Get you, dressed. You, you can watch videos however you want wherever you want but if you're on the video please be in a position and i the, it was weird to find the way to tell students that without being creepy right and and my I, the best thing i could come up with is i ex, uh, please be in a location position and state to be learning and interacting Mm -hmm. while, while being empathetic to the situation of each student that some of them don't have the best environment. Like I have my wonderful green screen behind you as do right. you. And we have yes, walls correct. behind us and not my mom walking behind me and my brother mm -hmm. and they're having a fight while I'm on camera and, and audio. We've got to be careful about that. But definitely, I mean, you got to make the effort to, you know, be, be mm -hmm. like you're in a classroom. So well, and, and I think, and I'm trying to keep phrasing it in terms of respect for yeah. one another. I try to keep phrasing it in terms of, you know, I want you to be ready to learn, ready to interact, ready mm -hmm. to engage, ready to, uh, none of the things, that, not being dressed, being in bed, right. those things, you know, you can sit on your bed, but you can sit ready to learn. And if you're not ready, then, then that's okay. Turn off the camera and don't connect and watch it later. I mean, that's why where my yeah. pushback is with admin who says everybody must have the camera on. Everybody, all your students should have the wall behind them because then we're not seeing their house where parents are going, wait a minute, I don't want them with the wall behind them because then I want to be able to walk by and see what they're doing when they're in class mm -hmm. during the day for my eight-year-old. 
So we got to be really careful what we're kind of um, institutionalized with the setup for our students and, and be a little bit empathetic about how their setup is so they're ready to learn. Well, no, and I was going to say, just to tag, tag on to that, Ken, um, again, I'm, I'm very blessed. Okay, I live in, in, a, in a place where yeah, I don't have to worry about food stability, things like clearly, okay. But at the same time, my child, my 15 year old is the primary caregiver for his special needs daughter yeah. in the morning or for his special needs sister, excuse me, my daughter, who's 11 yeah. in the morning because I'm working because that's the cultural expectation yeah. that I have. And so his school requires him to be online and present with camera on and so on and so oh, forth. Man. And I finally told him, I said, son, if they downgrade you for that, that's I'll fine. I'll you. have a discussion. I'll, I'll have that discussion with them. You won't need to worry about it. I said, because although we want to take as much of the load off of you as possible, this is a team effort. Yep. And, and so I, I have respect and empathy for others that have to deal with that team effort approach. And it's like, a lot I of think emp empathy is the word. Oh yeah, and a lot of our colleagues on Twitter have been saying like uh, this this idea with the camera, which I made a video about it and it was a little bit uh, polemic, but they said, you know, son, you turn off your camera because then you can hear better because we don't have good Wi-Fi right now. And if your teacher gets upset, I'm gonna talk to them because this is gonna make your learning experience better. I know this, but just making flat rules without thinking about the consequences yes. of them is, is tricky. Well, we're, Ken, we're having students that are eight to 12 uh, hours a day sitting yep, it's on crazy. A, a Zoom session and that's yep, it's too tiring. much. We complain it's about so many meetings in Zoom. <laughs> we kind yeah. of think, well, what are our students living Even, even for an adult person, that's not yeah. really and you've been living this too, Viv, and it's like a lot of meetings and hours that we need to be in front yes. of Zoom. Yes. But then you turn yeah. off Zoom and you're still in front of that computer. And then you realize your that homework they could have been emails. Yep. Not a whole two hours meeting. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. Absolutely. Well, speaking, speaking of, of that, up on time. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was okay. going to say, I, I have a little one to put away. Yeah. Thank so, you for joining um, Matthew and, and, and Katie and as well as Daniela and Biff and, and, and Durley. This has been great. Um, keep thinking about flexible. And that's what, that's what my drive is. Think about how we can think about flexible differently. And, and yeah. I'm really happy that you could all come. And uh, if anyone else that's out there and wants to join us for another week, next week is L, which is learning culture, which is one of my favorite uh, pillars of the flip learning pillars. Okay. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Any guys. Any last words before we yeah. sign off? Anyone yeah. can drop off. If you need to drop off, Matthew, drop right off. Any other thoughts before <laughs> I close the recording? No. no? Thanks, okay. guys. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, thank you, guys. All right, Goodbye. thank you, Katie. Have a good evening. Nice to meet you. Um, Kath, nice Catherine you and Daniela and Ernie. Ciao. Thank you. Nice to see you today and hear you today again, Matt and Katie. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. really. I hope, your, I hope your computer issues clear up. I'm going to hit the stop recording. Thank you, everyone who's watching this later.